And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Two nights featured show is Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. Welcome to the Republic News Network for our live national broadcast. You may call me Kelby, and tonight I'm going to be acting as your moderator. The RNN, which stands for the Republic News Network, has been doing this radio show since 2010, and it's always been a friendly introduction for the people of the United States Corporation. Here we go. It's true. The United States is a federal corporation, and their exclusive jurisdiction is in the District of Columbia. The Republic government was simply a bunch of U.S. citizens that in law don't have access to the Bill of Rights. And they realized they wanted to be Americans as our founders and our law provided each and every one of us. See, we've been hard at work since 2008. And since 2010, we have successfully re-inhabited the original government vacated under Lincoln in 1861. I know, it's hard to understand. Don't worry. We are law-abiding, peaceful Americans and very pro-government. And we love our country. You can consider the Republic members are tired of the corruption that we see every day. See, we found in the law that there is two forms of government here on the land, and we did something about it. We are people, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. We have families just like you. We simply found some truths, and now we're sharing these important truths with the rest of the world. So get ready to hear things that sound amazing, and get ready to understand that you, too, are about to be a part of history. We welcome each one of you to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel and your republic if you so choose. But before we go into our broadcast tonight, please bow your head in prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for this opportunity to come before you and, and share some important truth tonight about the situation that uh, is just a really ugly thing, Lord. Um, Father, be blessed by the hearts and the intentions. And Lord, I also ask for the protection of not only this republic nation, um, but the people that are on this uh, show this evening so that uh, they can speak freely and openly as as our country and our laws would provide. Um, bless them, keep them safe, keep their families safe. We pray this in your son's name only. Amen. What I'd like to do tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is yield the floor to Mr. Bob Barnett. Bob? Well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's uh, nice to be here tonight. Uh, Dan has left me with one of his most important shows and three extremely strong women. We have some fantastic guests tonight. Our guest host, Debbie Bakaupi, Basakaupi, uh, I apologize, Debbie, is a California cattle, cattle rancher, and she's the host tonight who is in demand throughout the West. She's an educational speaker, an expert, on Agenda 21, 2030, cap and trade, sustainable development, property rights, dams and water rights, conservation, other related issues throughout the West, primarily. Uh, she attends conferences including United Nations Conference in 2012 on Sustainable Development, COP21, 2015 UN Paris Climate Change Conference, Navigating the American Carbon World on Cap and Trade, Western Governors Association, Crucial Habitat Conferences, and many fish and wildlife meetings and hearings on the Endangered Species Act. She's co-produced and or inspired documentaries including Blue, No Water, No Farmer, No Food, and Wolves in Government Clothing, all focusing on the aggressive environmental policy and harming rural America. She's been discouraged by the erosion of rural America, ran for U.S. House in 2012, holds a B.S. in Business and Master's in Business Administration, certified meeting professional, and her entrepreneurial speaker, Passion Free Rural America and Changing Lives Through Education, has inspired her to open her own business with Roland Plus Fields, uh, she is senior editor of Technology News, and she has 
two guests. I mentioned three, three strong women's, and God bless the Finnick, the Finnick and family. Uh, the boy's wife, Jeanette Finnegan, is with us tonight, mother of 12 children and 25 grandchildren. And uh, Jeanette speaks about Lavoy, his character, who he was, what he was standing for. Also about her personal experience with BLM, FBI, and uh, since her husband's murder. Uh, also, another born ranch woman, Ramona Haig Morrison. Nevada is the oldest daughter of Wayne and Jean Haig. She grew up in ranches in Northern California and then Central Nevada has been intimately involved in her family's two federal court cases for nearly 40 years. She has firsthand absolute story of tyranny in litigation, 40 years fighting the government for property rights on their lands. And with that, I'm going to have our host tonight, uh, Debbie, uh, open her discussion with both Jeanette and Ramona, and we can get the real insight on what in the world has been going on in the Western United States and with ranching families in general throughout a number of the states. And uh, with that, I'll give it to you, Debbie. Thank you so much. I apprehend no danger to our country from a foreign foe. Our destruction, should it come at all, will be from another quarter. From the inattention of the people to the concerns of their government, from their carelessness, and negligence, I must confess that I do apprehend some danger. I fear that they may place too implicit a confidence in their public servants and fail properly to scrutinize their conduct. That in this way, they, we, us guys, may be made the dupes of designing men and become the instruments of their own undoing, our own undoing. Make them intelligent and they will be vigilant. Give them the means of detecting the wrong and they will apply the remedy. That was Daniel Webster in 1869. Our founding fathers forewarned us about a government that could get out of control, a government that would be abusive and tyrannical. Fast forward hundreds of years later and to January 26, January 26 2016, and we have an incident that is just a tragedy. Uh, in this room, I, I sit with Lavoie Senecum, uh, who was murdered a year ago, January 26, 2016, as this rancher from Arizona was just exercising his freedoms, his freedom of speech, his freedom of mobility, his freedom to discuss his grievances with others and assemble with others uh, about a government that just got just too big for its britches, I would say. And so I just want to thank you so much, Jeanette, for joining us this evening. I, I know it's it's been a tough year, and um, thank you for being here. Um, also, I've invited Ramona Hage Morrison to join us because this isn't new. A tyrannical government isn't new. Isn't a new thing. Daniel Webster had forewarned us, and in 1978, Ramona Hage's family started experiencing. Um, the abuses of a, of a uh, just a government that that is out of control was out of control and was continuing to be out of control. And in 1978, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter was the president, and um, Ramona's family fight has been for the last 40 years, as mentioned, and that has been through both Republicans and Democrats alike, and who have been in control. So this isn't a Republican or Democrat issue. This is. A, a freedom and liberty issue. And before we get to Ramona and what happened in 1978, which pretty much sets the stage to where uh, we are today with Lavoie Finnecum, I just wanted to uh, get a touch, get in touch with um, with Jeanette here. And Jeanette, can you tell us where things are right now um, with your husband, with what's been happening, 
and what we're doing here in John Day, Oregon. Well, we're here in John Day, Oregon to continue with his message, and his message was one of learning about the Constitution, about educating, and so that is what we're here in John Day for, to remember him by continuing uh, to educate. So we have some wonderful speakers, Chris Ann Hall, uh, Bill Norton, Garrett Smith, Kate Daly, my attorney Morgan Philpot, who is helping me with the BLM issues, will also be speaking. You may be on mute. Hello. Are you still there, Debbie? I am. How's the echoing? Are we echoing at all? No, you're good. Thank you. Okay, good. So, uh, so Jeanette, you and I spoke a while ago um, when you were in San Francisco. You were on a radio interview, and there were things that you were hearing newly about how your husband was treated. Can you share with the audience what you found out from court hearings? Yes. Just recently at the trial, it was made known to me that um, after they shot and killed my husband, they turned him over face down into the snow and, and tied his hands behind his back with a zip tie. He was dead and left him there the entire night. He was not taken until the next day. I, uh, I understand not until about 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So the government, somebody ordered for your husband to be killed. Do you know who that was and why? Well, I believe that, you know, we have out of control agents that work for us within this government. Um, we believe in a pro-responsible government, but there are people who work within this government that are abusive with their um, sacred delegated power and control that we the people elect them to do. And so I believe it was out of control agents that work with the, within the U.S. government. Ramona, this isn't new, is it? No, it's just that for the first time in modern Western history, we now have a martyr to the federal government. And, Ramona, um, can you? Oh, sorry. Can you, um, as you go on, briefly describe what happened to your family and um, where your your family's case is today? Okay. My family bought a ranch in 1978 in central Nevada that is comprised of 1% uh, private land and the rest of the ranch's range allotments, very much, I'm sure, like uh, Jeanette's ranch, and um, in most Western ranches. And from the very first year we bought that ranch, before we even had a reputation with the federal agencies, they started to um, make it almost impossible to run that ranch by loading our permit with uh, terms and conditions that were impossible to follow. In one grazing season, we received... Uh, 40 certified letters and 70 visits at Pine Creek, 60 miles from the nearest town, from Forest Service personnel issuing us notices and citations. And finally, in 1991, uh, the first raid of any sort on a western ranch happened at Pine Creek with 40 armed agents coming in with flak jackets and semi-automatic weapons to um, confiscate 100 head of cattle that they alleged were uh, overgrazing and in trespass. Um, we, they proved neither in a subsequent, subsequent uh, we've had about 13 weeks in federal court trials just for one family defending our property rights uh, and defending against false allegations of the federal government to begin with. And over that time, we've had two federal judges rule in our favor one found that the government had engaged in a conspiracy to deprive us of our property rights, our vested water rights, um, had found that the government had engaged in racketeering and had engaged in mail fraud, wire fraud, and fraud. And these two federal judges, after hearing the evidence and, and listening to the testimony at trial, 
came to the con- these conclusions and also recognized that the Western rancher and our, and us in spe- specifically had property interests on the federal federally managed lands that we had acquired from our predecessors and in interests, including vested stock water rights, vested irrigation water rights, rights of ways easements, and other improvements. And um, in one case, ruled that the government um, ruled against the government in a judgment, that, and we ended up with a $14 million judgment against the federal government for the uh, confiscation or the con- Fifth Amendment constitutional taking of those property rights. Those That case is still on appeal right now. We have a hearing uh, March 9th in Washington, D.C. regarding that case. And the other case uh, is uh, on remand back to the Nevada District Court, uh, and there, there's ongoing litigation there as well. But the point is, is we have my family, my parents before me, and my stepmother, all of whom now are dead, beginning <clears throat> when Jimmy Carter was president, have been involved in three administrative court hearings, uh, court cases. We won every one of them. We won a water adjudication, which granted all the rights on the ranch with regard to the water rights to my family. And in the federal courts, when we were in the trial, at the trial stage, we prevailed at every step. And it wasn't until we got to the appellate courts that we had some reversals. Um, and the, uh, this was a, appellate courts where they read a brief and you go in for a half hour hearing and they decide that what the trial judge um, said was irrelevant. So it is um, our case makes the case for every other Western rancher who has been in this fight in that the government will produce attorneys. They will litigate um, against you as long as you want to stay in the courts. And they will outlive you with their attorneys. They will outlive you with their um, cadre of attorneys and try to beat you down until you just go away. So every most other ranchers have never followed in our footsteps in the courts, and I don't blame them. They have no recourse. There is very little justice in the courts at this time. And so Lavoie and Clive and Bendy and others have been a voice um, for these very same rights that we defended in court in everything that they have done. So what I hear is that it doesn't matter who is in, who is in the White House, that even if we have a conservative uh, so-called Republican or Republican so-called conservative president, you still had, the Hage family, Ramona, you still had to go through battle um, whoever was in charge in the federal government, is that true? Yes. And so thinking about uh, Jeanette and, and Jeanette's case, I know that, Ramona, you have had a, a, a couple of thoughts or uh, questions um, for Jeanette. Um, Jeanette is, uh, what we're doing here in John Day County is, uh, it was a year ago that Lavoie was murdered. Tomorrow is his birthday. And so it's a uh, even for me, you know, a very emotional time. And Saturday and John Day, the Finnecombe family has put together an event that sounds like it's just going to be a fabulous event. It's going to be an event somewhat like Lavoy and others and the Bundys were uh, putting together for um, for a group of people who wanted to hear what was going on. It was supposed to be several hundred people who um, who did show up to hear what Lavoie and others had to say, and it was about the Constitution, and it was about freedom and liberty. To both of you, Ramona and Jeanette, what did your families do that was so wrong or so unlawful that we had a federal government come after you or come after Lavoie or after your family? Jeanette, can you answer that? Uh, Would you mind addressing that first? We did absolutely nothing wrong. We All we did was try to exercise our First Amendment right to to express ourselves and to peacefully assemble, to be heard. The um, public seems to think that 
ranchers are, you know, I'm just going to say out of control that, um, I don't know, um, maybe that our cows cause global warming because they, you know, emit methane like the oceans emit methane. Ramona, what was it that your family was supposedly doing wrong that the federal government unleashed itself on on your family for the next 40 years and even, you know, it's still going on in your family, the battle against the government? Well, like so many ranchers, um, my family was doing everything possible to follow the terms and conditions that the government had laid down on them, the Forest Service initially and the BLM later. And they were kind of the dot your I's, cross your T's, pay your taxes people, and so they felt it was their duty to follow those provisions. But they, but the provisions themselves were one; uh, they were never intended Unlawful. to to um, protect the land. They were intended to drive us out of business, and so they did everything they possibly could. And in fact, then when the government made allegations against us those allegations were never proven in court. And I guess that's the point. A federal bureaucrat of the lowest level can issue a notice, uh, a management level, can issue a notice to a rancher or to anybody else on federally managed lands. And it can be a false allegation with no proof. And you then either have to defend it, hire a lawyer and defend it, or waive your rights or or do what the, the notice tells you to do. And it is an impossible situation when you have bureaucrats who have so much power in their hands, basically the power of a prosecutor, to come after and target people. And that's basically what they did in my parents' case. They've done it across the West. In Nevada, there is probably a quarter of the livestock that, was, that the government originally adjudicated to be on these ranges about probably a quarter of them are left in Nevada because the government has systematically gone after the industry um, and taken people out incrementally and slowly um, over time so that they have virtually uh, destroyed the Western livestock industry. And it, it, it's basically the equivalent of the, the Scottish clan clearances when the British came in and, and removed the clans from the land in, in Scotland, in northern Scotland. It's very similar. And they are doing it systematically across the West. And they're using the permit, the grazing permit, and loading the terms and conditions of the grazing permit to such a point that people cannot, um, cannot operate without being in violation of some uh, edict from some uh, bureaucrat in a federal agency. I, I, I totally agree there with that. And it doesn't matter if you are following all of the terms and conditions within your contract, they will find and make new regulations to make you out of con compliance and then, you know, use that against you. They Correct. even have rules and regulations which they create in-house um, that, <coughs> that are available to the rancher to help, in, in, like in my case in particular, there are regulations on the books that allows for the surviving um, heirs to uh, when when a permittee dies i am considered the the heir to his estate and there are rules within that that the blm made themselves the regulations that they created themselves say that it gives two years to negotiate and come to terms with any problems within uh, with uh, with that permittee's uh, estate yet they're choosing not to allow me to tap into the ability to use that regulation. They're continuing to find other ways to make me out of compliance and therefore not allowing me to uh, go back onto my winter range and use it. And if I was to, at this point, say to heck with you and take my cows and go back out onto that winter range, they would then impound my cows and take them from me and then press charges against me. So you are danged if you do and danged if you don't. You have no legal recourse except for, and at this point, this is what I feel that the only thing I have left to do is to try it in the courts. And like Ramona said, I, I understand I'm, there's a 40 year battle already ahead of me that has hardly made any headway, but we have to start standing. We have to collectively start standing. We cannot allow them to continue to intimidate and bully us. We have to stand strong 
and move forward and do the best that we can. I very much agree with that. And I would argue that we have had so many men and women in in armed in the armed forces who have paid the ultimate price. Yes. Like Lavoy. And um that if we have to fight vigilantly in the courts or in the pl- public square or in any other means uh, legally available to us in this country that is as allowed by the Constitution, then we need to do it. Because if we don't, uh, we will lose all of our freedoms. And so I would argue that 40 years in a courtroom is, is a lot smaller price than what we've seen on the beaches of Normandy. Yes, I agree with that. I, I, I wish that we had more people that were um, – were had the had the strength to do this to stand um and because they have watched the Hage family for 40 years and because because of the Dan sisters or Joe Robertson and, and the Hammonds and they've watched in the Bundys and they've watched them lose everything or go to jail or um constant constantly in the courtroom and the stress and the and the battle fatigue in that sense People don't want to have to deal with that, so they just go back and hope that they they hide under this rock or something, hoping that they cannot be seen by this ugly monster that's continuing to destroy other people's lives, and they they just hope that the the dark shadow passes them by and that they don't get caught up in this. And I say to you, stand up, because collectively I believe that we can make a difference. Stand up and have some courage, and let's fight this together, because you will be next. They will find you. Yep. Well, one of the biggest... Oh, go ahead, Ramona. Oh, no, I'm sorry. One of the biggest um, problems, I think, for the Western ranching industry is the fact that that anybody who is not really from the West, or even from the ranching industry itself... um, they they have very little understanding and they right. of of how these ranches work and they think that basically we're we're here by permission of the government. Right. Yet we are here because our predecessors and in interest and our ancestors settled here back in the 1850s, 1860s and they took up these uh water rights and started grazing livestock out here. They acquired some private property, patented some private property in the process and they had rights and t- to use that land, and they had rights to the water. And those rights were recognized by the courts. They were recognized in every land law passed by Congress. They were protected in every land law passed by Congress, up to and including the Taylor Grazing Act and the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. And we were here years before, you know, decades before the federal agencies were here. But our, we were allowed to remain here because we had property interests in these lands that was recognized by the courts. And today, now, the federal government, and and this is just an illustrative term to describe it, for over 100 years, the Forest Service and later the BLM have been like cats in a litter box trying to cover up the reason we were here in the first place and have have tried to delegitimize us, tried to paint us into a corner as basically being serfs out here on these western lands as opposed to having a, a legitimate reason a legitimate for being claim. here. Yeah. And then they've coupled their efforts with the environmental groups who have demonized us as irresponsible right. land, you know, owners and land managers saying that we're harmful to this land and 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 we're it's the absolute opposite. We're much we are much more aware of how important it is to take care of the range so that we have it again the next year. But they have been very successful through the media, through these environmental groups and agencies that um, to continue to demonize us on that front as well. Well, and I would argue the rancher, uh, the stockman, has the vested interest in protecting the land. Right. They raise cattle and sheep by weight. They sell those cattle and sheep by weight. By weight. <laughs> and and if they do not have good range and they do not maintain and take care of that range and they have poor feed the next year, they end up affecting the bottom mm-hmm. line with yes. with regard to their livestock, yes. So we have a vested interest in protecting the range. And for over 150, 160, 170 years, the rancher has been out here right alongside the hunter, the fisherman, the miner, the 
Timberman, and anybody else who has had access to these admit, uh, federally administered lands. And we have never been in competition with those other interests. We all have been out not here together. Until, yeah, not, a, not until as of late. I'm starting to watch, you know, the political spectrum. We've watched a lot of separation and division throughout this last administration, and I'm watching it creep into that area as well. You know, mm-hmm. you, you hear the hunters start to really get after the ranchers because they think that we're ruining it for the hunter. And and so they're continuing to demonize and then separate and pit, pit one group against another, and they're doing that in our, our industry as well. That's right. We are I would, we are we are at um, the thirty minute mark, and I it's uh, time for a commercial break. And when we come back, you both are starting to uh, tap into a very very touchy issue, which is who really ultimately has control of the land. So with that, we're going to go off with a break. And thank you both for being here, and to all the listeners, thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're hearing um, a lot of information pertaining to people's rights being taken, please consider the Republic for the United States dot org, the Republic for the United States of America. There's already been a lot of Americans, that tens of thousands across this nation that have come together and and re inhabited the original republic. We we have a series of calls and shows and talks um that we've done over the last six, seven years that are posted on the Republic for the United States dot org. You can see our our nearly hundred and fifty page Declaration of Sovereign Intent, an awesome document that's absolutely going to change the, the course and the history of this nation. And at some point in the future you're going to look back at what the Republic has done for you uh in in a body politic of people holding uh in reserve this nation's republic that anybody can come in and stand in and hopefully eventually fill with the mass. Um, please go to our website, listen to uh, what we have done, and on Wednesday nights we have a Building the States phone call. That's literally teaching people how to county by county, state by state, um, reseat the original republic, and it's a great learning experience. Uh, again, uh, republicforthunitedstates.org. We thank you, and I yield. Are we back? You're back, Debbie. Go ahead. Great. Great. So um, before we went to break, we started to touch on some, you know, issues on environmental groups and hunters and fishermen and all sorts of people, uh, people who um, HOV or uh, or four-wheel and off-road vehicles, we're starting to experience that and where my parents' ranch is now. And so Ramona and Jeanette, um, there's only so much land, right? And uh, I just got back from a series of uh, environmental films that start to target um, who who really owns the land or who has right to the land. And an issue that has come up in the last um, couple of years has been the indigenous, the Native Americans, and it really is a touchy, touchy subject um, because the history of um, how the Indians, Native Americans, red people, I'm using all the terms that they've used, that they've used over the last, um, I, I was just at a conference this week, and these are the terms that came up, my people, my peoples, um, the original inhabitants of America. And what I see, and I'm wondering if you both see this too, is, you know, we've only got so much land. And who really controls the land? And I know, Ramona, with your history of having to get into the books and having to study our history, and can you address that? And with um, Jeanette, please feel free to follow up with what's happening with your land and your ability to work with your cows. And, um, yeah, Ramona, please. Well, I would like to go back just one moment to make another point because I think it draws an important point. The western rancher is the one who is out on the land in terms of he he or she is having to watch their cattle, their sheep, 
They're the ones keeping the springs clean. They're the ones uh, keeping right. the pipelines running. They're the ones maintaining the trails. You have to, when, when the government came and confiscated the cattle on our ranch and we, and we had to liquidate the rest of the cattle to keep the government from stealing the rest of it, um, we shut down. We had no reason any longer to pump or maintain water in one whole valley that's probably about half the size of Rhode Island. And at that point, there was no water for our cattle, but nor was there water for any wildlife. The only people that are hands-on involved in the actual management of these lands and the, and the actual stewards are the rancher, and it ends up benefiting everybody else who is out here, whether it be the hunter, the recreationalist, or anybody else. And I'll tell you, the minute our ranch was shut down, every canyon got became choked with willows. You could not get up the canyons because they were steep and hard to get up. Once the willows came in... Uh, and, and choked everything out, you couldn't even get up those canyons. And that included the hunters and the recreationalists and the RV people. So Wait, I, wait, but, but wait, hold on. I thought cows were terrible for the environment, Ramona. Well, I would argue that even bureaucrats mow their front lawn. They are God's <laughs> lawnmowers. And, you know, they are as natural as it gets. And I will tell you, when you, when you remove livestock, as the government has done, Oh, for the past, since, since the 80s and, and early 70s. They have been incrementally cutting. They have been shutting people down. They have been making it impossible to run. And so that we have vacant allotments. We have allotments with very few cattle on them or sheep on them. And what we've had as a result are fires in recent history right. that, that we never had prior to these last 40, year, 40 years. And as an example, you can drive from Reno, Nevada to Salt Lake City. And all you can see on either side of Highway 80 is cheatgrass, as far as the eye can see. And that is because it has been burned so much that the invasive species of cheatgrass is about all that comes in uh, anymore in that area. And you can attribute that to directly to government management policy, not the rancher, but the management policy imposed upon us by the government. The same is true for the Western Forest. They, the Forest Service should be embarrassed by how the Western Forests look um, as a result of their management practices that they have imposed on us for the last 30, 40 years. Jeanette, there's a video of your husband um, talking about how the BLM was just coming in and taking your water. Um, can you address that? And it was as if they owned the water. Can you address that? And is that still occurring? Um, what's going on with you and the BLM? Well, with the BLM and I, you know, from the beginning, from when my husband was killed, he, well, I'll back up just a little bit further. He made the announcement in 215, in September of 215, that he was no longer going to um, pay grazing fees to the BLM, that he wanted to take a production tax and pay it to the county where the county where we reside in and so that it could be distributed amongst um, our local area. Um, with that said, he, you know, then was murdered in January. And after that, the BLM then began to uh, pretty much I was on ignore for a while. And they didn't want to deal with me. They didn't recognize me as a legitimate owner. And when we started to have conversation, it was, well, you need to become the personal representative of the estate. Um, you have to fill out a contract. You have to have an environmental impact study done. Um, when, when pointing out that there was regulations that, uh, that there were their own regulations that said that I didn't have to do any of those things, they said, well, we don't use that particular regulation. We don't do it that way. So I, I've been delay the delay tactic has been put in place i have been uh, turned around in circles i provided all the things that they've wanted i i even so much as went and wrote the check for the the trespass fees that they said he had accrued um, after his death um, and they didn't want to accept that and so here i am i'm pushing 150 head which is not very many comparatively speaking to other ranchers but here I am out in the middle of the desert on horse pushing my cows to the winter range and I am told that they're not going to 
um, accept the check and I cannot go out to my ranch for um, the winter and I don't know where to go because I have nowhere else to put these cows. And um, so some friends came to my rescue and I was able to put my, what's interesting here in this story is that I was able to put them, truck them into a holding lot for a day and my sister-in-law came to me and said, you know, I went to the BLM and asked if you could put your cows on my range until we figure out this in the next 30 or 60 days, whatever it is that's being held up. And, and, and within 24 hours, the BLM was able to give her permission to, for me to put my cows there. Yet for nine months, they could not give me a definitive answer about what I could do to resolve this problem, nor did they allow me to use the regulations they have on, in place for me to continue to operate as uh, my business as usual um, since the death of my husband while we work out and negotiate and pay or whatever it is that they're requiring. I should still be allowed, according to their own regulations, be allowed to be out on my range with my cows right this very minute. But in 24 hours, I was able to put my cows somewhere else. That's amazing to me. Their plan is to never let me back out there, to never let me back out there. Ramona, does any of that ring true to your family and what happened um, to you guys? And, you know, do you, do you know what happened to your cows? Did you ever get your cows back? Oh, no. They, they confiscated them, sold them, and kept the proceeds. Um, that's what they did to a number of ranchers in, in Nevada. That's what they tried to do to Cliven. And um, that has been the, the MO. When they set out to target you, they will um, do exactly as Jeanette is describing. It's the same thing they did to us. It's the same thing they've done to numerous ranches across the West. And, the, and the, I, if you think about it, Jeanette and Lavoy own the water there. They own the, the right. stock water rights. They own interests in that land. And what the government has been doing for many many years is basically going after that water and they want us they want us to leave and they don't want to compensate us for anything that we own and they have spent millions of dollars in our case and millions of dollars in in these raids and in these uh various other actions that they have taken yet they refuse if they want it so bad to follow the fifth amendment of the constitution and come up and just put down a check and say, hey, you know, we want to convert your ranch to something else. We want to convert this area of land to something that has absolutely no cattle or sheep. But they refuse to do that. But they will go to the ends of the world to drive us off these rangelands, up to and including assassinating Lavoy Finnegan. And, and using the taxpayer money to do it. And using the taxpayer's money to do it, exactly. And what, gives, what has given them the power to do this? Well, I would argue that they are they are asserting authority they don't have in so many cases. In our case, they came after us for things we were doing lawfully. I would argue it was probably the same thing with Le, with Lavoy yeah. and Jeanette. We were following the law as as required, and my family were um, sticklers for following following the law, as I suspect Lavoy and Jeanette were. <clears throat> and so, um, but. To make a point of how far they will go, when they, when they went after Clive and Bundy, and I was on the Board of Agriculture at the time in Nevada, we had oversight authority with regard to the brand inspections that they would have had to give to the BLM to confiscate um, Cliven's cattle. And so I was in the middle of it, you could argue. They surrounded Clive and Bundy's ranch with 200 BLM snipers or so-called law enforcement officials. Yet the BLM was never granted law enforcement powers by Congress or anybody else. They claim they have it under the Assimilative Crimes Act, but the Assimilative Crimes Act is only apl applicable to a federal enclave such as um, the District of Columbia. And so they, they completely assert power they don't have. They, com they start on the with a completely illegal operation to begin with, and it's very clear that they surrounded that ranch with every intention of trying to haul Clive and Bundy out in a body bag. And it wasn't until a bunch of protesters and everybody else showed up, other ranchers and other people to support Cliven, that is what probably kept Cliven alive. And, and then 
um, it's a miracle that we didn't have a massacre there in Bunkerville because they were so ready. They had shoot-to-kill orders down there, and they were ready to take everybody out. And yet they did it without one bit of law enforcement authority. But they did it because they had the power to do it. So, and the you, American people don't understand any of it. We don't understand right. the Constitution. We don't understand the law. We don't understand what's happening. And so when we are, we, when we are being told different stories through the media, we believe what's first coming at us. We don't do our own investigation. We don't look into things further. We take everything that comes through that little black box as gospel truth. And we don't understand what's happening. I completely so we're agree. Partly to blame. We're, yeah. We, as a populace, are partly to blame for this. And what people don't seem to understand is today it's the rancher, tomorrow it will be you. If we don't start standing up for people and their rights to own property, it will be your property next. We have to start taking a look at underneath the surface of what we're being told. We have to start questioning what we're being told. We have to start digging and, and, and learning and reading and, and developing our own opinions, our own thoughts. We cannot continue to take everything from the 6 o'clock news. Um, I think they call it fake news now. <laughs> I think it's been fake news for quite a few years. And we people, we the people need to wake up to that. We need to understand that it's real, that it's really happening to good, innocent people in this country, and it will be you next. Well, and that gets back to the question that uh, that Debbie raised earlier with regard to the to the Native Americans who were out here first. And the government, uh, I would argue, the U.S. Army in particular, um, has failed to honor virtually every treaty with the federal uh, with the the tribes in the United States and the shenanigans that were pulled there frankly it's history repeating itself and um so I'm very I'm empathetic there's there's legal issues there that that I'm not um equipped to get or in, informed enough to get in, involved in there but but these issues this is nothing new and the minute we allow our government to uh, to become tyrannical and we are not actively engaged in, in pushing back and using every lawful authority that we have at our, at our hands, including the courts, to push back and to assert our rights, uh, then we don't have any right to complain. I and, totally um, agree. And, and I've, I'm afraid that we're getting to the point where um, – we we are I believe we're at the um, cusp of a turnaround. Either people are going to start standing with what they see as um, tyrannical and um, against the Constitution, and that we're not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm finding a lack of words here. I apologize, but if we don't start standing up collectively as a group and saying no more. You need to follow the rule of law like you're expecting us to follow the rule of law. And if we don't demand that of these irresponsible agents that we have put in charge, then we are going to deserve what we get. We will not have the freedom in this country that my parents and my parents and, and my grandparents actually, you know, had. Our children and grandchildren are going to live in a socialistic, communistic country and i would argue that we are already there yeah yep. well and i i think ex i agree exactly with what you said we are required to follow the law we want to follow the law uh, most ranchers that i know are law-abiding yep. citizens um, they are not down robbing the local 7-eleven and right. they're paying their taxes but by the same token the federal agencies should also follow the law and what has happened in both of these cases and across the West is these agencies are assert asserting powers they do not have, but they're dragging us into court to defend against those powers that they do not have. And, the and, laws, we have they make, and they're making these laws themselves. They're not being voted on or legislated or they're not going through Congress. They're making these laws and rules and regulations within their own agencies. 
and they're contrary to the laws of Congress as passed. Absolutely, absolutely. Ramona, being being involved in this in over 40 years, you know, we have a murder on our hands, and um, LaVoy, and I, I know that there are a lot of people coming this weekend to support the Finnecum family because they want justice. Yes, and I would have and, loved to have been there. I I was hoping to get up there. And, and I, um, I honor so much and, what what your family has been through, Jeanette. Thank you. And Trump has is keeping Comey. I know you had some thoughts, <laughs> Ramona, and I know that you've had some thoughts, Jeanette, about Comey. Um, I know we're in our about last 10 minutes or less of this this show and um, I'm so glad you're both here and I'm glad the audience is here. We um, in this administration, you know, I know that we're all hopeful, um, but I know that there is some concern and we are seeing with movies like Rise with the uh, Native Americans and the North Dakota pipeline, how they are actually assembling together quickly um, for right or for wrong but what they're doing that we are not doing, however, I would beg to differ that with the Fenicums and Saturday we have a group of it. We think somewhere around 500 people, right, Jeanette, showing up. But that's not plus. what we. <laughs> yeah. That's not what we generally do. But what it does do is it creates news these days. It gets on like Democracy Now News or CBS or. But it's not something that we ranchers, farmers, and you know, uh, it's not something we do. So, you know, as Comey continues in his position and Trump continues to clean house, then what do we do as people? Where do we go? How how do we get our stories out there that actually people, it does make a difference that, you know, that these cases don't go on 40 years like your family has been fighting. And we see the justice when it comes to what happened to Jeanette's husband. Well, I have a I have a thought on that. I am um I see that uh, I'm very encouraged with what President Trump has done so far and um I think yes. of all of the people that were of the 17 Republican candidates, the one the one thing that I liked about him from the get-go was I thought that he might actually understand the inherent sickness, the inherent um problem with our federal bureaucracy and might actually institute some reforms there, which is so desperately needed. Um, my concern is, though, that he has appointed um, or reappointed or kept Comey on as FBI director. And I am very concerned about that because he was directly involved or, or in communication with Governor Brown of Oregon over what happened in the roadblock in which they basically set up a, a trap to try to assassinate not only Lavoy, but in my opinion, everybody else in that truck. And they sat there and fired on that truck, um, trying to fin- trying to uh, kill everybody else in that truck. Well, those were FBI agents involved in that. And I would like to know um, if he is investigating those FBI agents, if he is holding those FBI agents accountable, or if he personally gave the order to do that. Now, I don't know. But I'm very concerned that he was involved with it, and he allowed that to happen under his watch. And um, I think that's a question that we should raise with the Trump administration. I I agree with that. I believe that my husband was denied his right to due process. And um, had he um, not been murdered that day, he would have been on the first seven that had stood trial in or in Portland and he would have been found not guilty and he would be home with me right now that's right so we definitely need to look into this well and I'm I'm concerned that with with Comey's direct involvement he was directly involved and um, the question is is what did he order his agents to effect an arrest is, or did they order – because that was not an arrest. That was not an, even an attempt at an arrest. That was something entirely different. In, um, that was an attempt to make sure those people never walked out of that truck. And, um, they certainly had a situation lined up there 
that escalated the situation. It did not, what they presented there escalated it. It did not by any means um, was, was it set up to help de-escalate. That's right. This was, this was no different than Ruby Ridge or Waco in that they set everybody up to take them down as opposed to arrest them. This is the same thing. And um, and I am very troubled about Comey's involvement in it. Jeanette still hasn't even seen the truck and uh, that was shot. So there are some serious serious holes besides the holes in the truck there are some serious holes in these stories and unless people stand up for each other as Jeanette is saying I have a feeling that these stories are going to the individual people are going to keep fighting and fighting until their last breath losing their money you know trying to just and this goes for ranchers and farmers and 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 small businesses alike um even under the Trump administration, it doesn't mean that locally things are going to go great because what we're seeing is when it comes to radical environmentalism and the push for the 2030 agenda and the new urban agenda, all these things are happening locally. And a lot of it isn't even recognized by the federal government, right? So, you know, locally, it, you know, it's great to have a president who we think is um, – Cleaning house is in draining the swamp as 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 he had promised, but locally, guys, this this continues. It continue, you know, this push for us to live in a sustainable development world is going to continue, and um, and I just hope that uh, that that we do see justice in in both your stories. I know that Ramona, for your family, uh, you did win in court at one point. The federal government owed you something like $14 million, and you have yet to be paid, even repaid, for all of your court costs, and knowing that Jeanette is just beginning the process. Um, and well, I, just all I, I've, not... I, have, I have been saying for quite some time, Jeanette, that I hope you have a very good civil rights lawyer, because this situation with, in your case, um, you know, what we have learned over 40 years of litigation with the federal agencies, with the Department of Justice in particular, is that they rarely do every, anything ethically or correctly. Right. <laughs> and um, they are ethically challenged, as I like to say. And um, unfortunately, it's it's part of the culture of these agencies. I wish it wasn't so. I, you know, it would be e it would be much more easy to understand if you were in a court case with an opposing party who followed the rules, but they do not, and that's, that's consistent. And so for them to hide evidence, for them to hide, uh, prevent discovery of, of evidence and anything in a court case, that's, that's the way it works with the Department and of it, Justice. It's amazing that they're never held accountable. When are we going to hold these irresponsible agents accountable? Yeah. I yeah. It's amazing that we continue to go through this and it's on every level in our government yes. in every uh, in our cities, in our towns, in our counties, at every level there are this lack of efficacy and out of control agents that just want the power. Um we have to as 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 a as a citizenry, we have to start standing up. We have to start holding them accountable and electing new uh, responsible agents into these well, positions and hold them responsible. And I think Debbie touched on something very important. So much of what is going on is happening at the local county commission yep. and the local city planner's office in the, in the water rights school office board. of the state engineer, school yeah. boards. And yeah. those are the places that we often pay the least attention to. But yeah. it's where we can be very effective if we are, if we are actively involved. Debbie, this is Bob. Uh, we are coming to the end here, and we want to make sure that, that each of you uh, have an opportunity to give contact information and, and uh, your, your different websites, any fundraising that's going on, and get that out to the listening public here. Yeah, and, you know, something that Jeanette, Ramona, and I have talked about is doing a conference 
of women. We feel that the men have taken so much of of the blame in this, and we women, you know, we want to step up. So if there are people out there who want to support us in what I'm calling the Mama Bear <laughs> Conference, because the Mama Bears have, you know, we're getting upset, and we see what's happening to our country, our cubs, our the future. And so, yeah, so great. Uh, to Ramona, how can people get in touch with you? Where can they email you if they have more questions? You bet. Um, my email is rh morrison. M O R R I S O N at S B C Global dot net. And Jeanette, what can we do to support you and your family? Get the word out about Lavoy? Well, you can contact us through the one cowboy stand for freedom dot com website. Um, you can uh, read our updates. There is a legal fund um button there if you want to help pitch in with the battle that I am just beginning with the BLM. Also, my email is n-e-t-t-e-d-j at msn.com for anybody who would like to talk with me personally. Great. And people can reach me, Debbie, at technocracy.news in the uh, the about page. And um, I just, you know, thank you so much for to the two of you. You women are heroes, and so many people just um, – just love to hear about your stories and want to see justice done for both you and your families. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Debbie, and blessings to you, Jeanette. Well, for Thank all you. of you, as a closing, I'd like to just add, uh, your biggest uphill battle is that the city dwellers, the people who are born and raised in urban settings lack much understanding about your lifestyle and that's that's part of what's so hard for you to get a powerful volume of people behind you they simply don't understand your life that's correct yes and furthermore most of the uh, bureaucrats regulating us are from the same background and they have a little bit of a college education and they basically uh, treat the rancher as if they're the village idiot with regard to range management. Right. We're uneducated village idiots. I like that. (laughs) That's exactly how they view us. You know, and there's a lot of other adjectives they like to string on um, with us as well, which none of which are true. And yet they have very little practical knowledge of how to do anything that we do as a matter of our daily lives. (laughs) I will say that you are outstanding spokeswomen compared to the ones I've seen on news clips about the Women's March. Oh, my goodness. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I hope we can uh, represent women in a much better light than that. You already have, just now for an hour. Thank you so much for coming with us. Kelby? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes this week's show with Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. God bless. Good night. We'll see you next Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific.